Good morning or good afternoon or good evening whenever you're actually <laughs> watching with us. We are so excited to have you back for our Spring Bible Study This Present Kingdom. That's and right. a shout out to all the ladies here in the Fellowship Hall. Good morning, ladies. Good morning, everybody. How are you? you? <laughs> to those of you in your small group rooms or those of you watching with us from home, we are so glad to have y'all today. Yes, and no matter what time it is, now is a great time to yes. click share on this stream so that your friends can join in with us as we continue our study of Matthew 5 today. Uh, we are just over a month into our study of this present kingdom, so let's take a minute to check in. How are you guys doing? Are you enjoying the study and everything going good? Yeah. If you're watching online, let us know in the comments below. Yes, and listen, we know that life gets crazy, um, especially as women. We have a lot of things on our plate. We have family, mm -hmm. you know, work, you know, all these other things going on. Just life. So, yes, it's it gets busy. really busy really fast. So if you find that you're falling behind in the study, please yeah. do not be discouraged. Just pick up that workbook wherever you are don't and jump give right up. in with us. Please don't give up. Do not give back up. You can always go back and check in on those days that you missed. Yes, thank you for that reminder. I used to beat myself up when I would miss days, like in my Bible reading plan. Um, and then I'd be so stressed out catching up that I wouldn't be able to just sit and let the Lord speak to me. So give yourself some grace and just pick, up, pick back up with us today. If you're taking this time right now to open the Word of God and let Him speak to you, then you are exactly where He wants you to be. Yeah, that is right. And just know that we are your cheerleaders here from yes. Bellevue Women cheering Woo! you on to you catch up with us in the study. <laughs> so do not be discouraged. Y'all, today we have Ms. Donna back with us, and she's going to be in Matthew 5, verses 21 through 30. So y'all can go ahead and get your Bibles ready with us this morning. Yes. And now, Paige, one of my favorite parts about the study this time is the kingdom exercise that we get to do on day five of each week. Yes, same. I really enjoy how the writers chose to add that in. So we have our four days of homework, our fifth day with our exercise. And like I said right. before, sometimes I just need somebody to tell me what to do. <laughs> so I love the practical steps. Practical application. Yes. I agree. So yesterday, just to recap, we read about silence and solitude. And the idea is that we will all seek to live out that kingdom exercise over the course of this next week. So looking back at our previous one that we were trying to live out this past week, it was service. Paige, do you want to share with the ladies some ideas or maybe how this impacted you? Yeah, sure. Actually, over the last couple of weeks, I've had a couple of ladies reach out to me. Um, you know, we've asked that y'all share with us, you know, yeah. how these kingdom exercises are going. And one of them that I really loved, so it's this sweet young mom. And they just moved into a new house, and it's one of those that, you know, needs the renovation. So she's in her new house. Mm -hmm. She's got her little kiddos. Woo. You know, still hasn't really gotten to know her neighbors yet. And one day, her next-door neighbor uh, reached out to her because she needed help with one of her pets. You mm -hmm. know, she had a situation going on, needed her to come over. And um, our sweet friend was like, I don't even know you. Yeah. And, you know, how can I do this? And just taking that moment to stop and realize that the Lord had given her an opportunity to serve. Yeah. That she could pause her busy schedule, even though it's completely valid. She's renovating. She's got toddlers. And sometimes. But she paused to serve her neighbor. And yeah. so it's just that sweet example. I loved how in the book um, it mentioned that the only requirement is that you in some way care for the need of others. It doesn't have to be something huge. It can be something right. small. It doesn't have to take all day. Yeah. So it was really sweet to hear y'all's story. So please share that with us in the comments. Reach out to us. Send me emails. We love to hear that. Exactly. I know you can relate to this page, but for me, in the season of life that I'm in, I'm required to do a lot of service in my home. And so I needed that reminder this week just to die to myself and to live mm. given. I loved that thought, live given. Mm. My flesh tries to creep back in when the, like the laundry is piling up or it's 3 a.m. and the baby's crying and you know, that idea yes. of living given and because I've been forgiven, pouring myself out as Christ did, mm. it just really helped me to kind of change my attitude and my perspective. Yeah, it really does. And it's a great reminder, like you said, for myself, other moms, caregivers that, you know, the Lord desires for us to live out these exercises to serve in some way. And he is going to give us that opportunity to be faithful. Yeah. Sometimes and it seems like an interruption. Yes. From and, our it, and it may, it yeah. may, but as long as we're faithful to follow through, you know, we can see that blessing in that as we live given for others. That's right. So ladies, if you haven't already, we want to remind you mm -hmm. to go to bellevue.org slash women to register for the study. Um, when you register, you're letting us know that you are part of this community here in Memphis and really all over the country um, who are studying this 
uh, passage together, and we'll send you a few emails each week just to give you some extra info and resources as we go. Yes, and ladies, as we prepare to jump in today's session, for those of you watching with us online, please don't forget to go ahead and share this feed on your own social media pages so your girlfriends can join with us. Those of you here on campus and even at home, if y'all want to go ahead and stand up as we um, join together to worship our Lord through worship. worship Jesus our Savior. He's the one that we can build our lives upon and he's worthy of our worship this morning. Let's sing. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. And we live.
and welcome. Welcome to Bellevue Women today. Thank you for joining us for week four in our study, This Present Kingdom, the Disruptive Message of the Sermon on the Mount. As I was studying the lesson this week, I was reminded of a situation that Bill and I encountered early on in our ministry. When Bill was in seminary, he received a phone call one day from a chairman of a deacons at a church who asked if we would come to their church the next Sunday and if Bill would preach that day. Their pastor of 38 years had just retired, and they were searching for a new one. We went, Bill preached, the people seemed warm and friendly, and then a couple of weeks later, the man called back again and asked if we would come and preach the next Sunday. We did that, and after Bill finished preaching that Sunday night, <clears throat> the deacon chairman and his wife asked if they could take us out to dinner that night. There was only one restaurant, restaurant in the town, so off to Dairy Queen we went. <laughs> after we got our food and we sat down, the deacon chairman told us that the pulpit committee was interested in talking to Bill about being their next pastor. And then he said, but you probably need to know some things about our church first. We are a conservative church. I mean, we are really conservative. We don't believe in ball teams. This church is not about sports and recreation. We are a conservative church. We also don't believe in bus ministries. We don't need a bunch more folks coming to our church. We're happy the way it is. (laughs) And then he says, there's another thing you need to know. We all like to play cards. And we would expect you to come and play cards with us on Friday night. And then he looked at me and said, Now, we believe a woman's place is either in the home or the classroom. And, and we also have a rule against women wearing pants to church. We are a conservative church. And then here was the clincher. I know, as if it wasn't bad enough already. (laughs) Prepare yourself. He said, but we do use real wine for the Lord's Supper. I mean, you can get drunk as a skunk if you drink too much of it. I'm just telling you, you can't make some of these things up. (laughs) You will probably not be surprised to know that when they called a few days later, Bill found a way to graciously decline (laughs) their invitation, forced to talk with them anymore. Here's the truth I want us to see this morning. Man-made rules are simply that. They are rules that are made by man. And rules that demand rule keeping for the sake of just keeping the rules are about absolutely nothing except behavior modification. That's what Jesus is talking about in the passage we looked at this week. When he leads with the phrase, you have heard, and then he follows up with, but I say. Kingdom living is not about following a bunch of do's and don'ts. Kingdom living is about following Jesus. The new life that Jesus is teaching about produces a new kind of heart transformation. It's about a new person, a person who is indwelt by Christ, operating, operating under the total control of the Holy Spirit. And you know what? When the relationship on the inside is right, the behavior on the outside will follow. 
And what freedom, what freedom it is to know that none of this is about our righteousness. Our rightness before God is completely dependent on Jesus. He is the Lord, our righteousness. Jehovah Sid Canoe. Nothing about us. It is all about him. Our righteousness is in Jesus alone, who has set us free from the law of sin and death by his shed blood at Calvary. Will you join with us this morning as we worship the one who paid for our freedom with his shed blood? Ladies, would you stand? Sing, come now, friend. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some
Take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your presence in this place. We offer our hearts to you now. Father, take them and seal them for your courts above. Give us spiritual sight and ears to hear what your spirit is saying. That we might live in the kingdom of heaven while here within the kingdom on earth. Lord, speak to us this morning. We want you above all else. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. Wow, beautiful. Well, we are getting now into the nitty-gritty. We've been looking at the Sermon on the Mount, and we began by looking at the Beatitudes or the how to bees. And the Lord was giving them instruction for the inner man. He's telling us what we're to be on the inside, exactly what we just sang about, what is going on in our hearts. And then we looked at last week what it means to be salt and light. The Lord has called us to so reflect him in a lost world that we are the light of the gospel everywhere we go. He also wants us to be salty. Now, he is contrasting here from here on out, actually, Tim Keller says, two good ways of living. <clears throat> the ways the Pharisees were living, the way they lived, according to the law, made them appear good, made them look good to everybody else. But we know they were not good on the inside because it was all about appearances. They wanted others to see them, to commend them, to admire them. So they were really living for the applause of man. We are to be living for the gospel. Tim Keller says you're basically contrasting gospel goodness and religious righteousness. Gospel goodness comes from the inside out. Religious righteousness is all about conforming outwardly. When we think about that, if we're going to be light and salt, we should be attracted to the world we should have the heart of Jesus Christ longing to go out into the world, but we should also be attractive to the world. The world should want what we have because of the wake of peace we leave behind, because of the fruit of the Spirit that should be evident in our lives, and that comes literally from the inside out. We can't manufacture it. <laughs> we can't grit our teeth and make it happen. We are to be salty Christians full of light. Now, you guys in here have just come from a small group. And in your small group, there are going to be people who have all the right answers. And you may leave there thinking, man, I wish I knew the Bible the way she did. But there's probably somebody in your group. It could be your leader. It could be somebody else in the group that just has the spirit of Christ upon them. They have answers and insight, but they never share it in a way that makes you feel less than. And when you leave that small group, you're thinking, I want to know Jesus like she does. I want to pray. I want to walk with him. I want to learn to hear his voice like she does. That, ladies, is a salty Christian. And that is what we should desire to be. So full of Christ that others want Christ in us. Now, I'm not saying that the gospel itself is not offensive, because the gospel is offensive. The gospel tells people that we can't be good enough to earn our way into heaven. The gospel tells people that we're lost and without hope apart from Jesus Christ. And that God does have a moral standard. But the moral standard comes after the heart is dealt with. It's much deeper than just the outward appearance of obeying the rules. In fact, that's kind of the phrase that I came up with for this week was, it's much deeper than that. It is much deeper than that. It goes way down within. I brought a glass this morning, and we're going to come back to this at the very end of our time together. But I'm going to put a little bit of water in here and stir it up. Doesn't that look lovely? Anybody want to drink? <laughs> 
Because unfortunately, this is how we feel sometimes. A little murky. We're trying to see through a biblical lens, and yet we seem to have a struggle sometimes seeing clearly. It's difficult for us to truly understand, and the only way we can is if we allow the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. So that's what we're asking God to do this morning. You know, Christian teaching is a vision that re-socializes people's values and habits, that creates a new community of people, a new covenant people who will live together in love and serve as a model for the world of God himself. We are to be a model of Christ. We are to be imitating Jesus Christ. We know that God has called us and he set us apart to be children of God. We're to live for the kingdom of heaven while we're living in the kingdom of this world. And for us to be salt and light, we must go much deeper than just our outward behavior. Jesus was not doing away with the law. And we looked at that. He said, I didn't come to abolish the law. In fact, not even a stroke of a pen is going to pass away without being fulfilled. He came to fulfill the law, and he's the only one who could. He's the only one who could obey it outwardly, but also have the internal motivation and attitude of heart that is pleasing to God and holy in his sight. Jesus made it clear that that's what he came to do. And when we come to Christ, we receive all the blessings of his righteousness. And the last statement in last week's study It's what the whole rest of the Sermon on the Mount is based on. Jesus said, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, the term righteousness and related words in Matthew consistently refer to a person's obedience to God's commands and conformity to his character expressed in personal behavior, speech, and attitudes. This does not suggest that either Jesus or Matthew regarded entrance as a reward earned by good works. Instead, they recognize surpassing righteousness as the necessary evidence of one's identity as a true disciple. Superior righteousness focuses upon manifesting divine character rather than merely keeping divine commands. And that comes from Charles Quarles' book on the Sermon on the Mount. And then R.T. Kendall says, the Pharisees' righteousness was an external righteousness. The Pharisees and scribes were empty shells. Godliness to them was all about appearances, what people could see and be impressed with. That's not Christianity. Christianity is not, as we've discussed already, about behavior modification. It is about heart transformation. So let's pick up where we left off last week. And we're going to begin in verse 21 of Matthew chapter 5. You have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the supreme court. And whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are with him on the way, so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Truly I say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid up the last cent." So what was Jesus saying here? He's referring back to the law. And he says, you've been told by the Pharisees, you have heard it said from the ancients, goes all the way back to Abraham, the law given through Moses. You've heard the law that was given to your ancestors and you've heard it said that you shall not commit murder. But what does Jesus say? But I say to you, He's not nullifying the law. He had just told us that. He didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. He's not nullifying the law. He's saying, but I say to you, it goes much deeper than that. It goes much deeper than just not murdering someone. It goes into the heart, do you hate? Do you look down upon? Are you demeaning in your treatment of others? That's what the Lord is looking at. And there are like six statements where Jesus is giving these principles for living. And this is the first one, that you shall not commit murder. Matthew 15, verse 19, tells us that it's out of the heart that come evil thoughts, murders, acts of adultery, other immoral sexual acts, thefts, false testimonies, and slanderous statements. So we know we need to focus on our heart. 
Our focus is to love the Lord and to hunger and thirst after righteousness. That's exactly one of the attitudes we're to have when we looked at the Beatitudes. So if we're hungering and thirsting after righteousness, we're not just to negatively focus on what we're not to do, but instead to actually love righteousness, to ask the Lord to give us a love for him, to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to literally love righteousness. Because it is as we fall in love with him and our love for Christ surpasses our love for self, that we actually are able to overcome sin, that sin loses its grip on us, that we're no longer entangled in it or even enticed by it. In fact, sin becomes disdainful. We're disgusted by our own sin. We're disgusted by what we see in our own lives. And we're quick to confess and to repent it to the Lord before the Lord so that he can cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And in humility of, humility of heart, I'm going to seek to pray and help guide others to the freedom for which Christ died. He came that we might have abundant life. Not getting by simply through gritting our teeth and pushing through. It does take dying to the flesh. It does take mortifying our flesh. But on the other side is the carefree life of trust and joy when we cast all our cares upon Jesus because he cares for us. And he literally said, his yoke is easy and his load is light. So if you're feel, feeling heavy laden, if you're discouraged and frustrated, could it be that you're striving in the flesh instead of surrendering to the Lord and allowing him to come in and have access to your heart and change your very desires. The Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. To delight yourself in the Lord literally means to make yourself soft and pliable in his hands. He is the potter. We are simply the clay. And he molds us so that our desires literally become his. And then he gives us what we delight in because he has become our delight. Allow him to capture your heart. And when I think about that, when I think about the love that we're to have for others and the care that we're to have and not to be demeaning, not to look down upon, he is saying, don't even hate. And we have to ask ourselves, Lord, do I have unforgiveness and hatred in my heart? Because if I do, that's the seeds of murder. It's the stuff of which murder is made. Or have you ever slandered someone and murdered their reputation? We need to be very careful what we allow to come out of our mouth because what? Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So we want our words to be edifying, uplifting, and light and salt. We want our lives to be as we care for others. And as we mentioned, gospel goodness will drive us into other people's lives. It will take us into the inner city. It will take us to people who are not like us. It will take us to those that we maybe disagree with us. And we will lovingly desire relationships with them. And to be able to have conversations without being antagonistic, without putting them down, but truly trying to understand. That's what he's saying. You don't have to be threatened by someone who doesn't believe everything exactly as you do. When you trust the Lord, you trust that he's taking you into people's lives and he's taking you into situations where you can be the salt and light that he has commanded us to be. And he said, live in such a way that they see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Why do we do it? Not like the Pharisees to be noticed by man. We do it so that we glorify our heavenly father. And when we surrender to him, he takes over and he's able to go so much further, do so much more, and he has access to the hearts and minds of others. You know, we've had some grandkids in our house this past week. I had Allie's four while she and Gentry were out of town and we have had so much fun with them. But I tell you what, it is busy. But every time I'm around my grandchildren, I am reminded of childlike trust. They love. And in fact, a couple of weeks ago, we had Bethany and David's little Ainsley. Ainsley was three in October. And she is just lighthearted and fun and, you know, very talkative. She has an amazing vocabulary. She just, we just, we get so tickled at her. And so we were putting them to bed one night. And I'd gotten Grace and her younger brother to bed. And Steve was telling Ainsley, a bedtime story, and he makes up these really silly stories. And so he's telling her a story, and she's laying in bed. She literally, not a care in the world, and she throws her head back, and she's laughing with her mouth wide open, just unbridled joy. And I walked into the room just at that moment, and my heart wanted to explode with love for her, with love for Steve laying there in that little 
twin bed, telling her bedtime stories. But it was like the Holy Spirit just spoke to me and said, Donna, this is childlike trust. Unless you become like a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And we have a heavenly father who has told us he will take care of every need we have. In fact, we're going to get into that as we get on into the Sermon on the Mount. That if we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all these other things that we sometimes get so worried about are going to fade away. He takes care of us. If we being evil do good things for our children, how much more will our heavenly father who is perfect do good things for us. How much more in another place it says, will he give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? All we have to do is ask him and depend upon him and lift it up to him and trust him. We don't have to make things happen. I was just talking to somebody a few minutes ago whose husband's praying about a career change. And I said, isn't it awesome that you don't have to make it happen, that you don't have to push a door open, that you just pray, you're willing and ready, and when God opens the door, you step through. That is what he's calling us to. If it's a relationship that's difficult, what does he tell us to do? If you're giving your offering at the altar, what are we supposed to do? And you remember, you know what, I offended somebody. Or there's been tension in a relationship. Or um, somebody, I need to ask someone to forgive me. What do I need to do? He's saying, basically, leave your sacrifice there. Your worship is worthless until your heart is right. First with the Lord and then with our fellow man. We're supposed to, as much as is possible, live at peace with everyone. So what are we to do? I'm worshiping this morning and my heart is uplifted and I'm worshiping the Lord. If God brings someone to my mind, then I may need to leave Bible study and go make a phone call or a visit. Or it may be in the worship service and we're listening to a message and God pierces our hearts. And we know the moment I leave here, I need to make a phone call or I need to go visit someone because I am not to allow anything to be an offense that would prevent someone else from walking in wholeness and purity of heart with the Lord. I don't want to be an offense. And before we allow that offense to grow even greater and it ends up being much larger, which is what he's saying, settle with your opponent before it gets to court. (laughs) Before it gets blown out of proportion, go immediately to that person and ask for their forgiveness. Or maybe you don't even realize that you've offended somebody. Have you ever had somebody come up and tell you that they forgive you for something that you were totally oblivious about? Yeah, I'm not always the most sensitive to other people because I'm so task-oriented and focused on my goals and what I'm doing. And so I have to really work at taking the blinders off and seeing those people that are around me. It's something the Lord has allowed me to make some progress in, but something I can still struggle with because if I'm, and Steve knows, okay, you know, like, you're in a tiz. You're, you're in that get her done, slap it around, make it happen. I can't hear you right now. I am focused. And that does not honor people. So I have to step back and say, you know what? People are more important than my list. And I want to honor those people that I'm present with by actually being present with them and listening and caring. Because I do care. But it's my temperament to be focused on getting things done and being efficient. So I have to remember, I could have offended someone not even knowing it. So how do I respond when someone comes to me and says, I just want you to know I forgive you for? Then I need to be not defensive, but gracious. Because even if I'm unaware of it, something I've done has wounded someone. Even if I think maybe, well, they're just a little too sensitive. That's not how how I'm to respond. I'm to respond by saying, I am so sorry. Because I would never want to do anything that would offend you and that would in any way grieve or quench the flow of the Holy Spirit in someone else or in my own life by refusing to own up to it. So do you see how deep this is going? (laughs) This is not surface righteousness. He's digging down deep. And when he does, sometimes we say, ouch, when he hits a nerve, right? So if we're presenting our offering, we leave it there. We are to be reconciled to one another. We have been called to reconciliation. In fact, dictionary.com says reconciliation means the restoration of friendly relations. Once again, to be at peace as much as possible with others. And you know what, though? You can reconcile without resolving all of the issues or completely restoring the relationship. Because sometimes when there's been a wound so deep or a breach of trust It takes time to rebuild trust. So it's not that the relationship is going to be immediately restored, but that we choose forgiveness because we've been forgiven. And we choose restoration, but restoration takes two parties. We can can be ministers of reconciliation without having full restoration. And we need to understand that. 
2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 19 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. We have been reconciled with God through Jesus Christ. And he has called us to the same ministry of reconciliation that he performed for us. We are to be working diligently, proactively, helping others be reconciled to the Lord and reconciled with each other. What deep work needs to be done to cleanse your heart? What is the Holy Spirit revealing to you as you're doing this study? You know, Jesus stated very clearly that he's dealing with the heart. So our next passage begins in verse 27. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it's better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it's better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Wow. What's he saying here? He's saying, you've heard that it said, don't commit the act. But I'm saying to you, it's much deeper than that. (laughs) It goes much deeper than that. And it goes into the heart. And you're not to look at someone with lust. You're not to covet someone else's spouse. How many of you last week were boiling water besides me? We were under a boil water advisory in Memphis, Tennessee, after everything froze up and some water mains broke. And so I decided to look online and see kind of how does this work? How do these water mains work? And how do we keep water from getting contaminated anyway? And one of the things I found out was that water mains can even have a crack in them. You know, when it breaks open, it's pretty evident there's a problem. And we need to fix it, that the water pressure has been affected. We need to let everybody know, hey, your water could be contaminated. There's a breach in the pipe. All the dirt and contaminants and bacteria can come into there. But what we sometimes don't realize is that even a crack in the water pipe If water pressure drops, creating a vacuum, it can suck in water and debris and bacteria into the pipe and it contaminates the water. Made me think about the command the Lord has given us to be filled with the Spirit. If my flesh is out of the way and the Spirit of God is able to be released in me and He is flowing forth, what did Jesus say? The Spirit of God would flow out of us like rivers of living water. So if every day I am spending time in the Word, I'm confessing anything God reveals before me, then I might walk blamelessly with Him. Now remember, not perfect, not sinless, but blameless with all revealed sin, confessed and repented of. I can walk blamelessly with the Lord so I'm not quenching which literally means it's like a tourniquet, cutting off the flow of the Spirit. That's what sin does. That's what unforgiveness and bitterness can do. That's what animosity toward a brother or sister in Christ can do. It quenches, it cuts off the flow of the Spirit. And guess what happens when the flow of the Spirit is cut off? The crack sucks in all this flesh. (laughs) And I'm hit with all these thoughts about that person or that situation. But if I'm filled with the Spirit then those cracks in my sin nature aren't open. There's not a vacuum to suck them in and to pull me back into the flesh, but instead I'm able to walk in the spirit. So I don't want my spirit pressure (laughs) to get so low that I've left a vacuum for my flesh to come back in and fill me back up because I've died to the flesh. Jesus said, I've got to daily deny myself, take up my cross and follow Jesus. It's on a daily basis basis. You know, you may have the spirit flowing freely on one day and the next day your water main can break. (laughs) Somebody can, you know, somebody can do something, some situation happens and you immediately step back into the flesh. But that's where we have to stop and confess. What does 1 John 1, 9 say? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I want to be cleansed, purified so that I can walk with the Lord, like Enoch did. You know, we look at him in Genesis 5, and then Hebrews 11 lists him in the hall of faith. And he walked with God, and Hebrews tells us it's because he so pleased God that God took him, and he was not. 
God took him home without him experiencing physical death because he walked so intimately with the Lord and so pleased the Lord that God just took him home. In this area of adultery and of lusting, we're to keep a pure heart. And ladies, we need to be careful that we don't dress in such a way that we can be a stumbling block to a brother in Christ or even to a lost man or woman nowadays. And we know I mean, we know. I was talking to Steve about that recently, and I know some teenage girls don't really get it. You know, they think they're just being fashionable, and I, I cut them some slacks and give them the benefit of the doubt. But anybody who's ever been married knows how difficult it is for a man and knows how visually wired men are. So any adult woman, I don't cut her so much slack. <laughs> we are not to dress to be a stumbling block. We're not to dress seductively. That is not how we are to portray Christ because we are holy, we have been purchased by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We no longer belong to ourselves. And not only that, you're worth so much more than that. You have been created in the image of God. You have inestimable worth. God has a good plan and a purpose for your life. And the enemy wants you in the midst of your insecurities and that breach in the main to allow your flesh to be sucked in and to control you so that the world gets back in and is feeding you the lies of the enemy, that your worth is based in what you look like or what size you wear or how seductive you are or how trim and fit your body is or whatever the enemy tells you, you're not. And I just want to encourage you, if, if you're a mom, don't be so focused on your body and how you look all the time that you're portraying that to your children and you're going to develop within them those same insecurities and those same worldly focuses. Instead, focus on the heart. Focus on who they are as followers of Jesus Christ and how you want to literally reflect Christ everywhere you go. And so the focus is going to be on the Lord and on others as we serve them. And there's incredible freedom in not caring not that you don't take care of yourself. Not that you don't want to be healthy. My body is a temple of the Lord. I want to eat healthy. I exercise. I want to take care of myself, mainly so I can be strong enough to lift my grandbabies. <laughs> some, of, some of them, we've got a two-year-old that's a little bruiser. I'm telling you what, not, I'm going to have to lift weights to keep up with him. But I want to be fit to fulfill the purpose God has for my life. I want to be able to go out and serve. I want to be able to love my neighbor as I love myself. And I can't do that if I'm not taking care of myself. So I'm not saying by any stretch of the imagination not to take care of yourself. But I'm saying that's not your priority. Your priority is your internal beauty. Your priority is to have that gentle and quiet spirit. And that literally means controlled strength and tranquility. It is not a mousy person. That's not what God is calling us to as women. You are created in the image of God. In fact, I, I taught biblical womanhood at Catalyst this past weekend as one of the breakout sessions. And as a woman, you are created as an azer, E-Z-E-R. It's the Hebrew word. And it literally means you're a strong helper, a strong warrior. That word is actually used 21 times in the Old Testament. And the majority of the time it is used to describe God as Israel's strong helper and protector. Now, you don't think women are strong? Mess with their husband or their children. <laughs> and watch Mama Bear come out, right? The Aetzer will be seen. God created us to love, to care for, to nurture, to protect. That's part of the way he wired us as women as being an Aetzer, a strong helper. It's a military term. And you will go to war for your family. We are called to be strong warriors for Jesus Christ. We are called as men and women to take up the cross of Jesus Christ and to live for him. And so when you did... We need to really just allow that to come out of our life through the power of his Holy Spirit. Jesus' advice is summed up in Paul's words. He says, don't offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. So every part of our body is to be offered to the Lord as an instrument of righteousness. You know, I was thinking about how sin is so much like cancer to the physical body sin is to the soul what cancer is the american cancer society says this is how cancer cells grow basically we're all made up of trillions of cells and over your lifetime normally they grow and divide they grow old and die but cancer starts when something goes wrong in the process and your cells keep making new cells but the older abnormal ones don't die when they should 
And as the cancer cells grow out of control, they can crowd out normal cells. And this makes it very hard for your body to work the way it should. We know that cancer, if left untreated, takes over, resulting in death. But it's the same with sin for our spirit and soul. If sin is not dealt with, if it's not cut out and cut off, (laughs) if it's not eradicated, it will take over. And if you're outside of Christ, it leads to eternal death. But if you're a believer, it can lead to a judgment death before him. Because 1 Corinthians 3 is very clear that we will stand before the Lord one day in judgment and our works will be judged. And if they're eternal, if they're things that Christ values, if they're the attitudes of the beatitudes, it's gold and silver and precious stones. That's what will come out of our works when it's tried by fire, our life as we stand before the Lord. But if we've invested in just the worldly things, if we've allowed resentment and bitterness and anger and jealousy and comparison to reside within our heart, that's hay, wood, and stubble. And the Bible says all of us as believers, our works are going to be judged, and we're also going to be judged for every idle word we've spoken. I don't know about you, but that terrifies me. Every idle word we've spoken is going to be judged by the Lord, and we're going to be held accountable for it. And if it's hay, wood, and stubble, it's going up in smoke. And 1 Corinthians 3 is so, so sad to me because it says some people will have nothing eternal to show for their lives. They're still going to enter heaven because they're saved, but they'll go as through smoke. They're going to go in smelling like smoke, basically. But if you've invested your life in those things that are eternal, and if you allowed Christ to take over your heart, you're being transformed from the inside out. And then your life will have gold, silver, and precious stones to lay before the feet of Jesus. Your life will have eternal value and worth. You know, sin, cancer in our thoughts, leads to sinful actions as it invades and takes over. And it literally becomes a compulsion to act if we focus on something. It's called a stronghold in scripture. And just like cancerous tumors must be cut out and blasted with chemotherapy or radiation, our sin must be cut off by the blood of Christ and God's word, the sword of the spirit. Unhealthy ways of thinking must be replaced with Christ honoring thoughts. So let's think about how the Holy Spirit does that. First of all, he starts with internal conviction. Now this is not in your notes, so if you wanna add it, feel free to. He convicts us, and the Bible tells us God is gracious. It says his loving kindness draws us to repentance. It is not condemnation. Romans 8 tells us there is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That takes a huge load off of us because the enemy comes in to condemn. The enemy is the one who gives guilt and shame and separates relationships. That's what the evil one does. That is not the Lord. The Lord comes in and convicts you through his loving kindness and his loving kindness is what draws us to repentance. But when we don't listen to that internal conviction, then there will be external chastening or consequences of that sin. And the Bible's very clear that God disciplines his own and that if someone claims to be a believer and they're living in open sin and not miserable over it and God's not disciplining them, they don't actually belong to the Lord. They're illegitimate because the Lord disciplines those he loves. He disciplines his children. And then the third form of discipline is the judgment seat of Christ that we just discussed. We're all going to be there one day. So I want to encourage all of us. (laughs) Let's be sensitive to the internal conviction of the Holy Spirit. He is so faithful to speak to us. But he is that still, small voice. He's not going to be shouting at you. The enemy shouts at you. Your flesh screams for attention. The Holy Spirit is that still, small voice, the loving kindness of God that's drawing you to repentance. You know, your future begins with what happens in your heart today. If you're in Christ Jesus, forget what lies behind. Focus forward and press on for the goal of the upward call of Christ. He's called each of us to run the race that he has marked for us. Let him have your heart today. And that's a quote that came out of our study from this week. Your future begins with what happens in your heart today. You know, I mentioned that I taught a breakout session on biblical womanhood at Catalyst this weekend. And 
the girls afterwards, because I lifted up Deborah and Huldah as two Old Testament heroes of mine, and they were women who didn't demand to be noticed. They didn't demand a place or position. They just sought the Lord with their whole heart, and God blessed them and met with them and talked with them, and people knew it. I mean, you know when somebody walks with the Lord so intimately that not only do they talk to him, he talks to them, and you go to them for wise counsel. Those are the salty Christians you seek out when you want someone to give you biblical, godly wisdom. We need to be those women. What was kind of fun because one of the small group leaders came up to me afterwards and she said, okay, my girls want a list. They want a checklist. Like, okay, what do we need to do to be Deborah or to be Hulda? And we started laughing about that. Is that not our flesh? Give me the checklist so I can be Deborah. I can be Hulda. I can be a godly woman. Well, there actually is a checklist. It's the spiritual disciplines. But the issue is they need to be done daily. We need to spend time in his word daily. Just as Jesus said, you've got to deny your flesh, take up your cross daily and follow me. That's how we do it. We do it by submitting ourselves to his word, having a systematic plan to read through God's word, sitting at his feet in prayer, listening for his voice. And our focus this week was for silence and solitude. And I'm not going to ask you who spent an hour because that was pretty ambitious of us to ask you to start, if you've never done this before, spending an entire hour in silence and solitude. Some of you probably did, but I want to encourage you, if that seemed intimidating or overwhelming to you, this week take 10 minutes. Set a timer on your clock and take 10 minutes to just sit quietly with the Lord. Ask the Lord to remove all distractions from your mind. I did this yesterday morning for 25 minutes I just sat in the presence of the Lord after I turned in my handout and had my quiet time. I just sat and listened for his voice. And do you know what he impressed upon my heart? That song about his goodness overtaking us, his goodness coming after us. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Sometimes we're fearful of being still and quiet because we're afraid of what we're going to see in our heart. If I stay busy and distracted, I don't have to deal with my stuff. But then there's no heart transformation. I stop growing in Christ's likeness. He's calling us to surrender. He's calling us to be still, to cease striving and know that He is God. You have a quote at the end of your handout from Strengthening the Soul of Your Leadership. Ruth Barton says, Just as the physical law of gravity ensures that sediment swirling in a jar of muddy river water will eventually settle and the water will become clear, so the spiritual law of gravity ensures that the chaos of the human soul will settle if it sits still long enough. See how much clearer this water is than it was when I first poured the water in and stirred it up. The longer it sits, the clearer it will become. But as long as I'm allowing the world to keep me stirred up, I'm not going to be able to see clearly or hear the voice of the Lord. The Lord prompted me to call someone yesterday, the moment I stood up from my time with him. And I called this person, not really having any idea why, just wanting to catch up. And she opened up to me and shared with me something that she believed God was laying on her heart, a direction he was taking her for service. But that very morning, she had been thinking, am I crazy to think this? Is this really the Lord? And I had a word of encouragement, and my spirit bore witness with it. And we ended up both crying together on the phone over it. I mean, it was just a precious, divine moment. And I got to pray with her. I would not have heard that if I had not sat with him. How many divine appointments do we miss because we don't stop and listen we're about to worship the Lord again the song lyrics are beautiful nothing else not your blessings nothing else only you let's worship
just want to sit here at your feet caught up in this holy moment never want to leave oh I'm not here for blessing Jesus you don't owe me anything more than anything that you can do I just want you I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions I'm sorry when I just sang another song take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda I'm sorry when I forgot that you're enough oh take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you I'm caught up in your presence I just want to see
if you would, bow your heads. The Spirit of the living God is in this room. He has graciously granted us his presence. And while your heart is there before the Lord, ask him, is there a place of unconfessed sin that you need to deal with today? As Donna was teaching, did you feel that prick of conviction? Just take a moment and ask God to reveal any area in your life you need to get right with him today. Father, we bless you. We bless you for loving us. Thank you for sending your son to take our place so that we could stand in his righteousness and in his righteousness alone. Father, we, your daughters, ask you to continue to do the work in our hearts, the transforming work in our hearts that makes us like your son, Jesus. Father, meet us in those deep interior places in our soul. Speak words of life to us. And then, Father, would you use us? Father, as you are conforming our inner person to the likeness of Christ, as we are submitting ourselves to you. Would you use us as your hands, your feet, your words to a lost and dying world who is desperately in need of you. Holy Spirit, seal the message Seal the word that was spoken to each one of us on our heart today. And do not let us get away from it until it accomplishes exactly what you would have it to do within each one of us today. It's in the name of your son, Jesus. The high and lofty one. The Lord, our righteousness that we pray. Amen.